Hello and welcome to our Underwriting Innovation Insight Series. The aim of this series is to provide you with tools to determine when and how to implement new digital underwriting solutions in your programs. My name is Jackie Wass and I'm the Vice President of Underwriting Research and Development at RGA. Today I had the pleasure of speaking with Brian Lanzareth, Director of Analytics at Exam One. He helped me tackle some of the big questions facing underwriting today. Stay tuned to find out how Exam One can help fill in the gaps for incomplete medical data, help underwriters explain Exam One's predictive model decisions, as well as looking at Exam One's product line and use cases. You won't want to miss our discussion, and at the end, we'll provide you with a list of the essentials you will need to know based off of this very insightful interview. So let's just jump right in. Welcome, Brian. Hi, thanks, thanks for having me. Of course, so glad you could be here. So Brian, over the past few years, we've seen an influx of new digital underwriting tools enter the life insurance space. Really makes sense, right? We've all heard about the value of these new solutions and what they can bring to the table. They can be faster, they can be less expensive, and in some instances, they can really lead to a better overall customer experience. Especially with a product such as Lab Picture, which can provide the underwriter with the access to labs without having the client be pricked by a needle once again. But along with all of the advantages of these new tools, we're also hearing that they can feel a bit incomplete. In a recent webinar, your team indicated that you can combine health and behavioral insights for real-time solutions to help fill in the gaps. Can you elaborate on what this means to your clients? Yeah, it's a, it's a very important point because when assessing an applicant's mortality risk, there are two major sources from which it can plausibly originate. The first, of course, familiar to everyone, is medical risks, heart attacks, uh, strokes, uh, diabetes, complications, things of that nature. The other major part, especially for younger applicants where accelerated underwriting tends to be most focused, is that behavioral risk more broadly defined. So motor vehicle accidents, um, to some degree, even suicide or homicide. So our behavioral data is derived primarily from our partnership with LexisNexis. So Lexis has a um, long established product called Risk Classifier, which derives from or extrapolates from uh, motor vehicle records, public records and elements of the credit report to predict mortality risk. And we essentially combine the two types of data elements that we and Lexis have access to, to build an integrated model, which is designed to fully reflect the overall mortality risk of a given applicant. And we've been able to demonstrate a fairly substantial mutual lift between our two data sources. So um, you get, gain a lot of insights from the medical data that you would not see from behavioral data alone and vice versa. So we're definitely seeing a, um, a lot of benefit from that combination. Thanks, Brian. As an underwriter, I know just how important understanding the whole picture can be in assessing and effectively communicating a risk to our clients. Speaking of communicating decisions, one of the hottest topics today, and possibly one of the most challenging topics for an underwriter, is how to explain decisions based off of predictive models to agents, to clients, and even to legislators. How does Exam 1 help clients use and communicate decisions based off of your models? Yeah, uh, interpretability is really second only to accuracy in our priority list for constructing our models. And as time has gone on, it's become an increasingly close second, to be honest with you. Uh, there are a number of approaches that we take to ensure that the, the results are interpretable and can be explained both to the day-to-day -day users and to other interested parties like regulators or um, agents. So the first of those is, is mechanistic and a little bit technical. It's in the methodology that we use to construct our models. So we use um, regression models for our, all, of our, um, all of our predictive model construction, which allows a, any particular outcome to be explicitly traced through the calculation process in a very step-by-step -step concrete way. And that contrasts with other approaches such as neural networks, for instance, or um, other less structured forms of machine learning where that type of traceability is not always maintainable. Um, beyond that, in a, in a slightly more maybe familiar approach to, to underwriters, we make use of underwriting expertise from our staff underwriters to essentially assign prior probabilities to individual features that we are considering incorporating into a model. And that, that's a very technical language, but what it basically says is that before we even allow our machine learning process to consider an attribute, we first have a human underwriter tell us whether they think that attribute is very likely, 
extremely unlikely, completely unreasonable as a possible input to a um, to a final model. And you know, even if they think it's unlikely, that doesn't necessarily forbid it from being included, but it does raise the bar. So it acts essentially as a prior probability in a Bayesian sense for incorporating that feature into a model. And it tends to leave you with a, a final product which is much more interpretable to human beings because human interpretable features have been overweighted in the feature selection process. And that can be done with, with as we've increasingly seen, with quite minimal, and in some cases, truly negligible impact on overall performance. So you don't have to go into incredibly obscure, hard to interpret features to get major boosts out of, um, out of predictive modeling. Um, so beyond that, in terms of the final interpretability at just a day-to-day -day level, we, because of the structure of our models, we're able, we're able to provide a ranked list of the individual factors which contributed most heavily to a risk assessment. So we can tell the end user that, for instance, in a particular applicant, it was the A1C that was most heavily driving the decision, or the liver function test panel, or, or whatever it may be. Uh, so we're able to give that level of individual description as well as that more systematic approach to assuring interpretability. Thank you, Brian. It sounds like exam one has put a lot of thought into how your products can be best used by underwriters. Speaking of your products, exam one offers a really impressive suite from prescription checks to medical claims to dental records through your recent partnership with Sika. One of the topics that I think would be of great interest to everyone is use case for each of your products. Starting with prescription check and ending with Sika, what would you say is the most popular and impactful use case? Prescription checks or script check is by far the, the longest established of our data products. So it's, it's used routinely in underwriting today. So the most popular use case probably is in automated, automated underwriting. And that is also the most impactful use case. It's, it's in many ways a very mature product, which is to say it can't be further refined. Um, but it's being used probably in most cases in the way that we would see it being used in the future, which is a contrast to some of the more emerging data sources like Lab Picture and Sika, where the use case is still progressing through the, the, the adoption curve. What about Lab Picture? So Lab Picture has probably attracted the most interest over the last few months, maybe even the last two years. It's definitely in a state of very rapid adoption, which is correlated with some pretty significant changes in how it's being used in the qualitative sense as well. So the most popular use case at the moment probably still is in manual review. That's changing very rapidly, but it's probably how it's being used currently. You're having a human being manually review the, the data that's provided and make a decision. But we are seeing a very rapid transition into the type of automated and accelerated decision making that's characteristic of script check, for instance. So we're, we're definitely moving in that direction of a more mature and more in more elaborately implemented product, I guess you would say. How about Health Picture? And I know we sometimes create our own confusion on this point, but Health Picture is basically the overarching platform for all of our data products. So there are a number of individual features that emerge solely out of Health Picture, like some of our scoring is technically categorized as a Health Picture feature as opposed to a feature of the individual data products, but essentially it's a platform that includes them all. And finally, Sika. And then finally, on that list of you know emerging data sources is Sika, which is our newest by far data source, and it offers a number of really interesting opportunities. And first and foremost, among many of them, is the potential for tobacco use disclosure. Uh, tobacco and build are sort of the two big missing pieces of fluidless underwriting currently. They're both absolutely key to risk assessment, but they are not well reflected in either prescription histories or even in, in many clinical data encounters because clinical laboratory encounters won't include um, uh, height and weight measurements because those, strictly speaking, aren't laboratory measurements, and they only rarely include nicotine testing because in a clinical space, doctors rely on their patients to be honest with them about their tobacco use, which isn't a reliance that an underwriter can have in a life insurance space. So the Sika dental data draws upon um, medical histories as collected in this case, specifically at dental offices to, um, to give us an insight into an applicant's tobacco history. And that's something that has attracted a lot of attention. It fills a, a very important goal, uh, hole in, um, in underwriting. And it really is the most credible method of assessing an applicant's tobacco status short of a full urine collection and associated codeine test. Thank you, Brian. 
Since each product brings a different value to the table, I would love to dig into them just a little bit more. And I think it would be fun to do this via a rapid fire session. So I hope that you're ready for this, but we're gonna give you 15 seconds on the clock and your 15 seconds will begin at the end of each question. So let's start. Are you FCRA compliant? Yes, definitely. Not only FCRA, but HIPAA compliant. So with that FCRA compliance limits us to a seven year look back period. The HIPAA compliance, of course, requires written authorization before we can release any of the data that we provide. Great. What is the turnaround time to retrieve your data? So I can say that in under 15 seconds. It's a few seconds at most. Fantastic. Do you have nationwide coverage? And if you do, does it vary by region or demographic population? We do have nationwide coverage. There is some geographical correlation in our hit rates, however. Um, for a lab picture in particular, the upper Midwest, which is basically Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and the Dakotas, tends to have moderately lower hit rates, although we still see significant coverage there. That's the major effect. Um, of course, for most medical data sources, you will see higher hit rates in older ages just because there's higher contact with the medical system in that population. Can you stratify the risk within a medical condition? Absolutely, and that's a key part of um, clinical history in particular. So with maybe the best example of this would be in diabetes. So you can have a diagnosis code that identifies a person as a diabetic. You might have medications that confirm that, something like a metformin prescription or even an insulin prescription. But even among applicants who have identical diagnoses and identical, identical prescription histories, there's enormous variance in the severity of that condition. And the most obvious way it would be assessed clinically is with an A1C value. So two applicants with identical prescription histories and identical diagnosis histories, one of whom has an A1C value of 8.7 and one of whom has a value of 6.3, represent dramatically different risk profiles. And that's something we're, we're very proud of our ability to stratify on within lab picture. Thanks, Brian. That's really great information. Although the 15 second time clock seems like it may have been a little unfair based off of all the products you had to cover. How about for the last two, we really focus on health picture. So with health picture, how frequently can you identify tobacco, build and blood pressure? We get some type of tobacco test, usually codeine testing, about 13% of the time. But as I just mentioned, we've recently added CICA data, which um, as I, as I said, provides um, self-disclosed tobacco data from dental encounters. The hit rate for CICA data is about 50%, give or take. And when an, an applicant is a tobacco user and we have a CICA hit, we estimate that that is reflected in the data a large majority of the time. So it is a substantial boost in our coverage of, of tobacco data. Um, again, closing one of the most significant gaps in accelerated underwriting today. So we see um, a, a hit rate for building blood pressure that's pretty comparable to what we see for nicotine testing, about 13% of all hits. Um, that's one way of getting to that data. There are others as well. So the, the quantitative, you know, a BMI of 24.8, for instance, that is present in about 15% of cases. But for instance, diagnosis codes that identifies a person as being overweight or obese or morbidly obese, those add another, you know, five to 10 points. So between the two, you can get a fairly good insight into build and blood pressure in some respect on maybe 20% or a bit more of, of all hits. You read my mind, Brian. I was going to ask about how layering in CICA data could help further identify smokers. I do want to add that, you know, CICA, although the immediate interest, obviously, and for good reason, is on tobacco use, it, it covers a, a much larger universe of medical conditions, um, everything from cancer to heart disease and half a dozen others that I'm probably forgetting at the moment. So, you know, you'll, a lot of applicants or a lot of carriers have sort of come for tobacco and stayed for the additional flags that can be provided from that source. All right, final rapid fire question. How frequently do you refresh and update your risk scores? Uh, about every 12 months. It varies a little bit depending upon our workload and our IT department schedule, honestly, but about every year. Wow, thanks, Brian. I think our viewers have learned a lot about your current products and how they can incorporate them into their underwriting programs. Now I'm gonna ask you to take a look into your crystal ball and tell me where you see the industry moving in the next three to five years and how you envision exam one supporting it. Well, obviously there's been a long-term trend toward accelerated underwriting and we expect to see that continuing. Although to be fair, I think at some point there is a kind of um, asymptote or, or sort of a limit beyond which you're going to be you know, still collecting blood 
on those few relatively difficult to underwrite high value cases where the data may not quite provide the level of comfort that you would expect. But that's, that's going to be a minority of cases. For the majority, we will see um, expanded use of accelerated underwriting, hopefully assisted by uh, many of the data products that we provide. And, key, and crucially there, um, although a lot of carriers have begun to draw in a lot of data sources, the final step is in integrating all of that data into a, a unified synoptic view of an applicant's mortality risk. And whether that's done through scoring or through some other process of um, evaluating and, and underwriting the results, that's probably the next major evolution that we see in the, in the progression toward accelerated underwriting. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet today. I, for one, have learned so much. Before we break, I'm going to give you one final time clock. So in the next 30 seconds, and it's a loaded question, can you tell us everything you think our audience needs to know about exam one? Well, I think we've covered a lot of the, the major points um, in earlier in the discussion, but I think the one area that I would like to emphasize is the, the growing hit rates that we've experienced in lab picture in particular. So, you know, as recently as the beginning of this year, we were a little bit above 50% in our hit rates. Um, most recently, for the last month, we were approaching 70%, and we're exceeding that in, in certain clients. And that, that's not just a quantitative improvement, but a, it can enable a qualitative shift in how the data is used when it's provided so consistently. So that, that, that increase is something that we've worked very hard to attain, and I think it will have a, a major effect on the, on the use and adoption of lab picture in particular. Thank you, Brian. It truly has been a pleasure speaking with you. I've learned a lot about what Exam1 has to offer and how it helps underwriters. I can't wait to see what the future holds. Yeah, absolutely. It was great talking to you.